I am grateful for your invitation to speak on the Epistle of James for a number of sessions. The first session is introductory. And I would like to start out by saying that James uh, has not always been appreciated. Um, we are in the Reformed faith, and we are not liberals, but even in the Reformation time, Luther put a pall on the book of James, because he believed that the Lord Jesus Christ is hardly ever mentioned, and that is a very big mistake. In fact, the, Holy, uh, the Lord Jesus is mentioned only twice, and possibly an implication a third time. And the Holy Spirit is not mentioned at all. And in a sense, uh, James looks a little bit like Esther. God is not mentioned. Only providence, how that works out in the church, and how it works out in the world. And people have uh, just uh, scratched their heads about both Esther and James. And I think that is a mistake. Because if the Holy Spirit decides to put Esther and James in the Bible, we should not scratch our head, but we should ask what is the purpose. And the purpose is simple. Esther has only one goal. Don't talk about anything else. The rest of the Bible may talk about it, but I want to hammer this home that God is a God of providence. You see it in the world and you see it in the church. And any other information may come out of the rest of the scriptures, but he hammers that home. Now James is exactly the same. When Luther says he does, uh, James does not talk about the Lord Jesus, he does not even mention that he doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit at all. So he's very focused, and I understand why. Because his big fight was with Roman Catholicism in the area of justification. That was the heart of the gospel according to him. And if you don't mention that, you are already in a troubled situation. In fact, when he translated the scripture, he put James all the way at the end of the New Testament, and I have a hunch that if James had fallen off, he would not have had a tear about that. Now, liberals, about 300, 400 years later, did not agree with Luther, of course, in his... Uh, systematic theology and his understanding and his love for the Word of God. No, 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 no. But uh, they looked at James and they said there is no rhyme or reason to it. It is just uh, a bunch of pearls and he goes from one to the other. But uh, don't ask for a rhyme and a reason. And that Paul, that twofold Paul, was not lifted in my estimation until the 90s, 80s, when people began to write commentaries on James and said, wait a minute, he stands on his own two feet, so let us give him the attention that he deserves. But still, my dear friends, Luther, the reformer, and De Abelius, also a German, they really kind of closed the door to the message of James. Now, I have been attracted to James for 50 years, and it was only a couple of years ago that I began to understand why I was attracted to James. Because there are three things that we must do. We must evangelize daily, we must share the word daily, 
and we must serve daily and uh, we don't have time enough to go to the scriptures and uh, to show it because that is not the focus. And if we are trained in evangelism and we trained in sharing the word and we are trained in serving, which we really should do, there are Cert we are certified in every one of those areas. We are competent to evangelize, competent to speak, and competent to serve. And if we do that for any length of time, we become not only competent, but we're going to find that God has given us a specific gift, either in evangelism, or in speaking, or in serving. Now, the evangelistic gift is one-fold, just like a midwife, you know. Now, the speaking gift is two-fold, and the th serving gift is three-fold, according to Romans 12. The one-fold uh, gift in evangelism is very simple, you share the gospel. The speaking area has two gifts according to the Apostle Paul, teaching and exhorting. And the service gift is threefold. You share your skills, you care when you see that there's a more of a problem, and you, in, the, in the sharing area you give people uh, $10 to catch the bus, in the caring area you say, oh, I, have to, I have to bring you to the doctor because there's somewhere a problem. And the third one is the mercy area. You bring it to the hospital because the person is dying. Now I'm not going to talk about that. I'm only going to share with you the speaking area. But there's teaching and exhorting. Now uh, James says that when the word of God comes to you, and we'll talk about that later, the Lord willing, when the word of God comes to you, uh, you better listen very, very carefully. And you better not talk back. And you never be. And you better not become angry. And I have uh, told an audience at one time, if you give me 24 hours, I promise you, I'm going to get you angry. Uh, with the application of the word of God. And if uh, I give myself to you, you get me angry. All right. So that is even Stephen. Now teachers, teachers, um, they share the word of God. But James says, if you are not, if you listen, you don't become angry, uh, and, and uh, you don't talk back, uh, but you don't act upon it, then you still delude yourself. Mm -hmm. So you have all the doctrines in your mind, and, in, and uh, you can talk about it, but you don't act upon it. You're like a person who looks in the mirror, you see your hair disheveled, you're in your PJs, and you're going to pay a visit to your president, and uh, he kicks you out of the house, or out of the White House, you see what I mean? Because he's not, he will not accept that. And nobody will do that. But James says, if a Christian is an act, he's like that. Now teachers uh, produce anacondas or pythons. They go into the piggery and they pick up a little piglet and they digest it uh, half asleep for a whole week and then it goes back to the piggery. And many people in the church are like anacondas. They love the preacher, they get a little uh, a piglet sermon and it tastes ex very wonderful and then they fall half asleep during the, the week they don't act upon it, and next week they come back for another piglet, all right? Now, <laughs> and I think that the preacher in this audience says, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> all, right. all right. Now, that is teachers. They are happy when you know your stuff. But exhorters are unhappy until you do your stuff. God says, some people have the gift of evangelism, some people have the gift of speaking, either teaching or exhorting, and other people have the gift of serving, sharing, caring, or showing mercy. Now, in my estimation, 
I began to recognize it's not a matter of pride, because if you don't know your gift, you don't want to be trained, you're ignorant, you're lazy, nah, 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 you're indifferent, who cares, <clears throat> or you're not a Christian. So in my estimation, and that's still introductory, a church must try, seek to find out the giftedness of God in the people. Because when you have the gift, you become unstoppable. And if you don't have the gift, you run out of steam. Because it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now in my estimation, God has given me the gift of exhorting. And exhorters see hairline fractures everywhere. And there's a lady by the name of Lindsay Vaughn. She had a hairline fracture in her knee. And she put a little brace on it. And the next day she went downhill again. And she said, now oh, wait a minute. It may be that there's more than just one hairline fracture. And she went to uh, a couple of uh, experts. And they found three of them. In my estimation, the church has hairline fractures and they put a brace on and they think they can move on and that is eventually, it's not going to work. They are going to fracture and they are not going to be productive. Now, the, the teachers shows you the total truth of God from Genesis to Revelation in distinction from the evangelist who only talks about the gospel to enter the people into the church and then the pastor teacher is going to go from Genesis all the way to Revelation and the exhorters, is, and exhorters are making sure that you act upon it. Now in my estimation James is an exhorter. And I can prove that immediately. Uh, Paul is a teacher. He exhorts. Every teacher exhorts. And every exhorter teaches, of course. But uh, Paul says, if you don't love the Lord Jesus, you're accursed. And uh, that is teaching. But uh, James says, you adulterers and adulteresses. <laughs> you see, that's exhortation. And if I would mention that to a church, you are adulterers and adulteresses, and it would not be in the Bible, or you don't need, know James, you would be offended. But uh, that's what James is saying, and hopefully we get to it eventually. That is the exhortation. It's very interesting that while Luther put that Paul over James, he doesn't talk about Jesus. It's a letter of straw. There Dabelius, who says, well, there's no rhyme or reason to it, still says it is a booklet of exhortation. And people throw Dabelius out. They are now only also throw Luther out. Okay. And they throw Dabelius out. And, and, but they, they don't pick up that he is right in the fact of exhortation. All right. Now, um, it is uh, very, very interesting uh, that um, uh, th uh, th this booklet, this James, if you want to get a handle on it, you have to understand that it is very early in the New Testament. Now Luther even thought that it was not James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote it, because the brother of Jesus would talk about Jesus. So if you don't talk about Jesus, you could not be the brother of Jesus. Uh, and he has all kinds of funny ideas about it, but uh, the church has said this is James, the brother of Jesus. Now why does he not talk about the Lord Jesus except in two occasions, so rather sparing? Why does he not talk about the Holy Spirit? Well, this is a book of the Holy Spirit. And that is how the Holy Spirit starts in the New Testament. That is the first booklet written. And uh, you can <coughs> prove that because most commentaries today are in total agreement. That is a very early, in fact the earliest book, even uh, before 
uh, uh, Galatians or 1 Thessalonians uh, um, is the earliest book because it is so Jewish. <clears throat> now, um, he talks about the law, he talks about the synagogue, you know, those are terminologies that the early church would have understood. Now, uh, I have to uh, add one thing to it. <clears throat> People have said, well, uh, the early church, uh, they're Jews, so James only talks to Christians of Jewish descent. The pagans don't come into the picture. So pagans know only Jewish Christians. Now to me, that is not a proper statement. Because it is written to the 12 tribes. Now, people say, well, those are Jews. Well, the 12 tribes are also <coughs> mentioned in a kind of a symbolical fashion, namely the total church of the Lord Jesus. And that's what I believe. Because if you think that this is only to Jewish Christians, uh, you can uh, wave some of it off, you know, oh, that's not for us, only for Jewish Christians, so we don't have to listen. No, 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 he speaks to the 12 tribes, and that is uh, not literal, it's figurative, it's symbolical for the total church of Jesus, but in the early goings, the 12 tribes were predominantly, if not in a sense exclusively, consisting of Jewish Christians. It is only later when Paul comes into the picture that you get a lot of Gentiles. Now it's very interesting, there were not too many Jews in the church, even in the beginning, and uh, the church was overwhelmed with Gentile Christians, and that is why James <coughs> was accepted so much later, you see, Paul made a splash to the Gentiles, the Gentiles applauded, and therefore everybody, uh, everybody agreed with the Pauline epistles. Uh, in fact, the Pauline epistles were accepted uh, when it went north from Jerusalem through Europe into Rome, but James was uh, accepted through the southern route, Cairo, and uh, then uh, our origin, and then Hippo and, uh, and, and Augustine, but there were a lot less people, so James was not as well known, but eventually it was endorsed on both sides, all right? So most of the people at the time that James writes are Jewish Christians, but it is meant for everybody. But now the question is, what does he want to get across? Now, in my estimation, this is fundamental. People have recognized that James looks very much like the Sermon on the Mount. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, you don't have any reference to Jesus. <laughs> and you don't have a reference to the Holy Spirit. And one aspect of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer. And somebody had the audacity <coughs> in the Lord's Prayer to say that the Lord's Prayer was not really a Christian prayer because Christ was not in the Lord's Prayer. Now that is audacity. What are Jesus? What, what did he try to get across in the Sermon on the Mount? Everybody agrees it's the constitution of the church. <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters, it's exactly the same what James wants to get across. And you can only understand that if you go back into the Old Testament and you ask what is the Old Testament all about. And I am convinced that the Old Testament is the book of God the Father. It's not the book of the Son, it's not the book of the Holy Spirit, it's the book of God the Father. You find in that Old Testament the sum total of the perfections of our God. That is why it is two-thirds of the Bible. You come face to face with the Father. 
and specifically his holiness. What did God do in the flood? Well, my dear friends, if you had lived before the flood, God would have drowned you also <laughs> for a very good reason. How about the judges? When in the time of Gideon, they say to the Lord, Lord, why don't you uh, look after us? He said, <laughs> what have you done for generations? The time of the kings. All, even the most beautiful kings, had serious trouble. David, in the middle of his uh, ministry, decided to commit adultery and murder. And the latter part of his life, you don't find many exploits. Now, he was a man after God's heart, but he was kind of shelved. Solomon, at the end of his life, if Solomon would be a pastor of this church, he would have a little shrine of uh, Islam on the left side, a shrine of Buddha on the right hand side, a shrine of the six uh, uh, in the back of the church, and he would do the rounds. No wonder that God says, I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you. And then you think of beautiful kings like Jehoshaphat, who gave his uh, son a woman out of the house of Ahab who eventually tried to kill the whole house of David. As, uh, Azah, um, Isaiah, who when he became strong decided that he was going to take over the temple worship. Asa, uh, when he um, uh, was in trouble later on, earlier he leaned on the Lord and he, and he defeated the million uh, Ethiopians. But then at the end of his life, uh, he began to rely on the Syrians. And when the prophet said, no, 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 he put him in jail. Uh, Hezekiah became proud at the end of his life. My dear brothers and sisters, you see in two-thirds of the Bible the horror, the horror of the world before the flood. And the horror of Israel after the flood that led to the exile. And in the exile, God says, I am going to make a difference. I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the heart of stone out of you and give you a heart of flesh. <clears throat> I wash you of all your filth and I put the Holy Spirit within you. That is regeneration, a heart transplant. It is justification, you get the righteousness of God, and you get and it is sanctification. Now regeneration is like the floor of a building. Justification is like the walls. But sanctification is the ceiling, the roof. And God says, in the words of Jesus, I am perfect, you are perfect. You will never get there unless you're born again. You will never get there until you're justified by faith. But that is my grand goal. I am the Holy One of Israel. Be holy. And James says, that's what I'm going to drive home. You must be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Mm. So for all practical purposes, he summarizes the Old Testament and he puts the ceiling on the Old Testament. As Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount. But at the same time, it is the, it is the flooring of the New Testament. <laughs> so if you want to enter into the presence of God, and you already see it in Genesis, if you want to enter into the presence of God, you must be a man of faith, Abraham. You must be a man of repentance, Jacob. And you must be a man of holiness, Joseph. 
And if you take a look at uh, uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, it's all the same, my dear brothers and sisters. Holiness, 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 holiness. And James says, if, if you want to be a member of the church of Jesus Christ, then that is what I'm going to emphasize. And that's what I'm going to teach you. And I'm not just going to give you a few pearls. No, 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 no. I'm going to give you a well-architected epistle so that you can understand what the New Testament doctrine of sanctification is all about. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is something that Luther did not understand. And Dibelius uh, did not understand it either, but he had at least one thing very clear. They, they, they're all uh, exhortations. They're all exhortations. And even in uh, modern commentaries, uh, that is not really understood. Now, exhorters are not happy when you know your stuff. Exhorters are only happy when you do your stuff. And you see the hairline fractures that he opens up. My dear brothers and sisters, it is an awesome little booklet. And I believe that I was drawn to it because I think that God gave me the gift of exhortation. And I'll tell you, if you're in the church, if you are a teacher, you need to ask an exhorter, do you see hairline fractures? And an exhorter should say to the teacher, please lay it out. Because you, uh, in your gift area, you can sparkle. You can sparkle as an evangelist. You can sparkle as a teacher and exhorter. Or you sparkle as a man who shares, cares, who, or shows mercy. And when you sparkle, you can spark. So when I want you to, want you to learn how to evangelize, I'm going to put you in the company of people who have an evangelistic gift because they sparkle. If I want you to speak the word, I'm going to put you in the company of a person who sparkles in teaching and if I want you to move I want you to put you in, a, in the company of a, of a person who sparkles in exhorting and if I etc want you to uh, learn how to share care and show mercy I want you to put you in the, in, the, in the company of people who are sparkling in that area now if you have a gift you can become a leader in the church if you have an evangelistic gift, you can become an evangelist. If you have a uh, speaking gift, you can become a pastor, teacher, exhorter. If you have a serving gift, you can become a deacon, sharing, caring, or showing mercy. Now, brothers and sisters, the three uh, offices are like a plumber, an electrician, and a, and a carpenter. Now, we all know how to do some plumbing, some electric, electrical work, and some carpentry work. Everybody knows how to put a bulb in the, in the, in the uh, whatever. Everybody knows how to put a nail in the wall to hang up something. Everybody knows how to plunge a, a toilet, you see what I mean? Everybody knows that. But if you really have a sewage problem, are you going to ask an electrician? No. Or a carpenter? No. And if the roof caves in, are you going to have ask an electrician or a plumber? No. And, um, and uh, if all of a sudden the electricity goes out, are you asking a plumber or a, or a carpenter? No, 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 no. Now, every one of those uh, leaders are selectively brilliant. Now, if you put everything under the umbrella of an evangelist, you get a shallow church. If you put everything under the umbrella of a teacher, you get a ghetto church. Because they don't go out. If you ever put everything under the umbrella of a deacon, you get a go social gospel church. That is why I do not believe in an Episcopal system, because there's only one man in charge. And one man does not have all the giftedness. 
And it's amazing when I go into Anglican uh, situations, I look at the, the one man in charge and I see which direction they go and which aspects they neglect. And in the Church of Jesus, we must be absolutely humble. I am not an evangelist with an evangelistic gift. I am not a teacher with a teaching gift. I am not a deacon with a sharing, caring or mercy gift. No, we must do all, uh, all things. We all must evangelize, we all must teach, we all must exhort, we all must share, we all must care, we all must show mercy. But when the going gets rough, you need a person who has that giftedness. And we must train the people into the giftedness. I have asked people in conferences, would you like to marry a man or a woman, a young man or a young woman, who is not certified in all evangelism, speaking and serving, who has no giftedness in those three areas, in one of the three areas, in other words, who is stoppable, and they always say, no, and now what if you don't train your young men or women? They remain unmarried, you see. So, uh, so this is the broad background, but James says, I am not covering the waterfront. Esther says, I don't cover the whole waterfront. There's only one thing I will drill into your conscience, that's providence, 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 providence. Look at Esther. It was such a mess. It must have been planned, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a mess! <laughs> Look at your own life, right? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and everybody laughs, except the young people, because they don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what the Bible says, amen? Yeah. Okay. In, uh, in Africa, when they say hallelujah, the preacher says hallelujah, and the congregation says yah. So, hallelujah, yah. Ah, now we're talking, okay? So, James says, I am no focused, I am narrowly focused. But what are you going to do if you want to put a big oil rig in the ocean? Are you going to drill a deep pillar or are you going to have a superficial pillar? If it's not deep. And I wiped out, you see. So this is what he wants to say. And now we understand that I tell people when you go to the book of James, <clears throat> what, is, what is the theme of the book of James? Sir. Oh, it is the tongue. Oh, it's justification by faith. Oh, it is this, that, or the other. Well, Nabilius says they're all kind of pearls, so you pick a pearl and you take one pearl and you make it the umbrella of everything. It's not going to work. So I finally found out, after having studied nearly every commentary on the subject, that the only umbrella over the totality of this booklet is practical godliness, holiness. And that is God the Father. And when you go downhill, and he says, I'm going to take the heart of stone out of you, I'm going to wash away your filth and put the Holy Spirit within you. You go downhill, you need a Savior. And that is Jesus. And the fullness of the Father is in the Lord Jesus. So uh, the more you see the Old Testament as the book of God the Father, the more you see how glorious the Savior is, because of the totality of the Father that comes in the Lord Jesus. And therefore the Gospel is the book of the Lord Jesus. Every page. Every page. And then in the Gospel of John he says, If you see me, you see the Father, so you better study the Father so that you know who I am. And as the Savior. <clears throat> when the Father says, I give you a heart of, a heart of flesh, I wash you all your filth, and I put the Holy Spirit within you, what he want, means to say, it's I, you need a heart transplant, uh, that filth must be gone, and you need a new righteousness, and that uh, destruction in your life must be gone, 
I have to give you a new holiness. Well, if I promise you a vehicle uh, like a Mercedes-Benz, uh, well, I need a factory to, 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 uh, to have it produced. Jesus is the factory of the promise of God, the Father. He kills the old heart on the cross. He gets rid of your filth through his blood. And he eliminates uh, the, the, the poison that James is talking about, uh, according to Hebrews, uh, the 10th the chapter, uh, in his death. And, and Jesus, all your problems disappear on the cross. And in the resurrection, you get the newness. You get the heart of Jesus, you get the righteousness of Jesus, you get the holiness of Jesus. But James says, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about one thing only. I know that that heart is in, must be implanted by the Holy Spirit, but I'm not talking about that. I know that the righteousness is sealed by the Holy Spirit, but I'm not talking about that. I know that the Holy Spirit must apply the holiness of Jesus to you, but I'm not talking about that. Whatever Paul says, whatever Peter says, whatever John says, it's wonderful, but it is an extensive set of footnotes on my epistle. Additions. And Jesus says that in the 16th chapter, I'll send you the Holy Spirit because I have not told you the whole gospel. There are certain things you could not bear. But when the Holy Spirit comes, He will take it out of me. It's not uh, Joseph Smith additions to Jesus. No, He takes it out of me. It is not Jehovah's Witnesses in addition to... No, no, no. He takes it out of me, but He brings my fullness, and that's how He glorifies me, because my fullness is the fullness of God the Father. It's not my beauty, it is the beauty of God the Father. And therefore, brothers and sisters, Jesus says, you're going to get a Peter, you're going to get a John, you get a Paul, uh, you get a Jude. Uh, all those men are coming in to make that gospel full-orbed. You don't get the full gospel in the gospel. And that's what Jesus says. And so when liberals say, well, I want to, be, to belong to Jesus, and Paul, he just uh, messed it up. In fact, in the Episcopal Church in the United States, there's somebody who says exactly that. Paul messed up Jesus with his views about homosexuality, etc. And they don't listen to Jesus. Jesus says, I did not tell you everything. That is why the Old Testament book of God the Father, and there you see the fullness that comes in Jesus. The Gospel is the book of Jesus, and the Epistles are the book of the Holy Spirit. The Father promises, the Son produces, and the Holy Spirit transports. And now we go into this little booklet of James, understanding that he is very narrow. Now, somebody once said, he is not very evangelistic. Brothers and sisters, there are two things that we must do. We must make disciples, and that's evangelism. <coughs> and we must teach them to observe whatever I have commanded them. <laughs> now, do you think <laughs> that James is not a revival man? Brothers and sisters, he was there on the day of Pentecost. He saw that. And he was, a, a, he was on top of uh, uh, the leadership in, the book of, in Jerusalem. And uh, he was hated for that. And of course he evangelized. But that is not his focus. His focus is teach him to observe whatever God has commanded. So don't tell the Holy Spirit that he cannot do what he wants to do. Amen? Amen. So, hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah. Now, after this uh, rather long introduction to set the tone 
Now, if I would have only one or two times, I wouldn't have done it, but now you're going to take this with you, and you will never forget it, all right? I always tell people, if a teacher is not memorable, you should go back to school, okay? Uh, because it's like chewing the cud on Sunday morning. If, you, if, if, you, if you, uh, a cow has many stomachs, he chews the cud, and at the end of the week, you know, all the nutrients are in his system. If you forget on Monday morning what the preacher preached about on, on uh, Sunday, uh, you cannot chew the cud, you know, and, and, and you don't get the nutrients. So make sure that you, are, that you come through and, and that's why you've got to be simple enough to be profound, okay? Uh, and profoundly enough to be simple, all right? And now we go into the beautiful book of, of James. James has four aspects. The first one is the pathway to holiness from a divine perspective. And very interesting, then he says two things. First of all, he talks about trials and temptations. And secondly, he talks about the Word of God. And I ask myself the question, why do you not first of all talk about the Word of God? And later on about trials and temptations. And I begin to understand. All of life is one big trial. Or it is a series of trials that are the uninterrupted. And we'll talk about that later. All right? And I love the fact that you smile. <laughs> but when you get in the trials, sometimes you don't smile. All right? But at least I, 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 I love that, you see? And the trials are like the furrows that God plows into your life. Have you ever noticed if there are no furrows and you put a seed on the ground, what happens? Nothing. So the furrows are there to receive the word. So the trials come first and then the word. So that is the pathway to holiness. If God wants to make you holy, he's going to put furrows in your life so that the word of God can be put in there, implanted, and you become godly. All right, that's number one. Number two are the principles of holiness. There are two principles of holiness, namely the law of God is the substance of holiness. So if you want to know what the word is going to do in your furrows, it is the law of God. So you must understand the Ten Commandments, and James is talking about that. Then, when you have the law of God by itself, the law can never make you holy. Impossible. God tried it on, on Mount Sinai, and he failed big time, methodologically. He said, this is the way you're going to fail. And that is why you turn to Jesus. And that is preparatory for Jesus. But the law also gives you substantially the substance of holiness, the content of holiness. All right? But you need faith in order to put it into practice. And that is the second principle. You're justified by faith. You're justified by works. James says you are de de demonstrated, proven to be righteous by your works. But you arrive in the presence of God through the righteousness of Jesus. They talk about totally different aspects. Paul and James stand back to back and so that they cannot be attacked. They defend each other to 100%. And they talk about different types of justification. Now it's very interesting that when you go to the presbytery and you ask the young man who wants to enter 
uh, the Presbyterian wants to be ordained. Uh, what do you believe? Justification by faith or justification by works? Like clockwork, he will say justification by faith. And I said, that's wrong. It's both. And that is the horror of the Paul over James. Luther's influence has been destructive. Now he was such an awesome individual that I am not worthy to tie or untie his shoelaces. But the best of man is only man at best. And people have told the Luther, you're wrong. For 300 years. But you know, there are two big types of, more than two, but I only mentioned two types of bills, legal currency in the United States. And the one is a one dollar bill, and the second is a two dollar bill. Now the two dollar bills are legal currency. But have you ever seen one recently? Many of them, no, you see. James is like a two-dollar bill. It is there in the vault, but nobody sees it. Ah, uh, some people, of course. Nobody is not always nobody, and nothing is not always nothing. But James, but Paul, justified by faith, my dear brothers and sisters, that is a one-dollar bill, and it's everywhere. And you even see it in your hymns. Most of the hymns are in the area of justification. Not the Psalms. The Psalms are in the area of sanctification. David the warrior. Brothers and sisters, I love those hymns, but if you only sing hymns, it is like a person who preaches and says, I'm going to read to you a section of John Calvin, and now I'm going to preach. He said, what in the world are you doing? Don't you take the word? And you can quote Calvin, but you take the word. If you sing, why would you sing the songs of people who are emotional about something, and why don't you sing the word of God? Now, I have nothing against quoting them. I have no problem if you, if you let them sing, but you have to recognize that the man, the best of man is man at best. And so I would say, you preach the word and you sing the word. Now I don't mind if you put uh, Romans 8 on, on song <laughs> and you sing that too, okay. But why, why, why would I want to sing what Charles Wesley likes? Well, what he likes I like, but if I only sing what I like, I promise you, you're going to suffer. If uh, the lady smiles and she loves broccoli and it's the only vegetable that she has uh, shown, she given to her kids and to her husband for 10, 20 years, broccoli, 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 all the time, and <laughs> that's not going to work. You've got to be full orb and well-rounded in everything. So here, my dear brothers and sisters, the pathway to holiness is the furrows and the word, Temptation, trial, and the word, and the principles of holiness is the law of God and faith. I'm going to show you that faith is awesome. It's not just that faith without works is dead, but faith is awesome. But we'll get that later in the world. Then the third aspect is the attainment of holiness. Now we have seen the pathway, the principles, but how do you attain to it? Well, there's an enemy on the inside. There's an obstacle to victory. And therefore, the only victory comes from above, the nature of victory. But how do you get to that? The requirements for victory. So very beautifully put together by, by James. And then finally, the range of practical godliness or holiness. You face the outside world, other people, or your future. You face yourself in the area of riches or poverty. And I explain that later, the Lord willing. And you face your circumstances 
And you come to the conclusion that James covers the waterfront. Covers the waterfront. It's amazing. It's not seen. And if you say it's only for the Jewish Christians, then what are you talking about? Not for the, for the Gentiles. And we can sit there in the arena and we see the Jew, Jewish Christians struggle and fight. Well, it doesn't really uh, apply to us. And the interesting thing is that again and again you find commentaries saying, well, this uh, really pertains to outsiders and you don't find this in the church. And I say, what are you talking about? This applies every word, applies to us. And we must be contrite and tremble at every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, in the conclusion of this introduction, you see the author in terms of the introduction, and uh, is James. We see the addressees, that is the total church of Jesus, we see the date very early in the Church of Jesus. We see the theme, practical godliness. And we see the aim, I want you to be practically godly. Now brothers and sisters, and I preached on that once, uh, after three times the people were saying to me, uh, when are you going to talk about the love of God, also about the holiness of God? And they were upset. And so the next uh, time uh, I said, let's have a question and answer period. And there was one question, uh, why do you talk about the holiness and you don't talk about the love of God? I said, well, if you ask me to talk about uh, James, I talk about holiness. If you want to ask me to talk about John 3.16, I want to talk about the love of God. But there's even more and deeper. You know what John, First John says? Herein the love of God is perfected that you will be like Jesus and then you have assurance in the day of judgment. So the greatest gift of the love of God is for you to be holy. And I said to the people, um, uh, I have been talking about the love of God from beginning to end. Love is a desire to be united to a person. It's a delight when you are one. And you do everything for people to be one. And that love is unconditional, that's in spite of what we are. But it is anti-conditional, we fight what is wrong. And it's reconditioning. If I love a Volkswagen Beetle and I see one on the side of the road, I said, that's in terrible shape. But I love the Volkswagen Beetle and I'm going to put it in a garage and when it comes out, it is reconditioned. And when it's finally in my garage in heaven, it is in mint condition. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right. So, so I am talking to you about the love of God, all right. Now finally, in terms of the conclusion, very interesting. James says, if you uh, see people straying from the truth, go after them and return them to the truth. Convert them. Now people say, well, only God can convert. Of course, I know that. But God does it through us. So the Bible says, convert them, you see. And if they're converted, I say, you say, thank you, Lord. But you're 100% involved. All right. And James says, why do I give you that conclusion? Because you have to do what I do, what I told you. And you have to do it the way I do it. So in the, in the letter, he gives a blueprint of how we ought to um, uh, move in the church. If you see a hairline fracture, work on it immediately. And if you do it, they will be saved from death. And you will cover a multitude of sins. That is not only in the people to whom you talk. But brothers and sisters, do we have a multitude of sins? Be honest. We always confess our sin, but we don't specify. You know what David says? I am a preacher of righteousness. I never hold it in. I pour it forth. I am big time and loud. 
And two verses later, more numerous are my iniquities than the hairs of my head. That is the warrior. And the Bible says, brothers and sisters, you have a multitude of sins. But if you do, James says what I do. And you go after hairline fractures and triple fractures and, and multiple fractures. And you go after it. God will also cover your sins. If a little girl says to mommy, I want to help you make the bed. And the little girl walks into the bedroom with mud on her shoes. You're not going to say, ah. You say, ah. Uh, uh, you say, I love you for that. You are going, you move. Uh, but, but next time, take the, don't bring the mud in again. You see what I mean? That's how God deals with us. We deal with our children. So that's how God deals with us. But if you are strained from the truth and you returned, you will not die. And your multitude of sins will be taken away from you, but also from the one who preaches and teaches. And I cannot tell you what a joy that is. Because when I look in the mirror, I say, Lord, I want to break them all. And what do I did? And my wife restored. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. That is a little joke. Okay, a little joke. Uh, at any rate, you see, but that is the issue. Okay? James, holiness, holiness, holiness. Go after people. Make sure that you exhort daily. So that you will not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. <clears throat> That's what James is all about. Mm -hmm. And that is the conclusion of the first session.